This is CBC Here and Now. Muskrat Falls is all about the B words, another billion dollars on a boondoggle price tag. Was the public betrayed? I think this project is a hell of a lot worse a deal than the Upper Churchill. Cost overruns, loss of schedule, all those sorts of things that we are dealing with. Politicians are poking their noses in potholes. The Auditor General warns that makes our highways unsafe. Please welcome Matthew and her brave crew under Master David Allen Williams. And 20 years since the big party in Bonavista, how one event kick-started an industry. A rainy Saturday coming for the province, especially on the southwest coast. But Sunday is shaping up nicely. All your weekend weather details coming up. It's too late to stop now, but newly uncovered documents from inside Nalcor suggest senior officials and former politicians were warned of the risks of delays and spiraling costs. And that's just one big headline from a day of revelations about the mega project. Today we learned the cost of Muskrat Falls is going up by another billion dollars. And hold on to your wallet because what you pay for electricity today will double when the power starts flowing from Labrador. Now, Corps CEO Stan Marshall says the project should never have been given the green light. And Premier Dwight Ball blames the people who used to be in charge of hiding the truth about what they knew was coming. Here now is Rob Antle has been on this story all day. He's joining us now live in our studio. So Rob, break down the numbers. Well, right off the top, you can tack another billion dollars onto the Muskrat Falls tab. The total cost of the project is now expected to be $12.7 billion. Nalcor CEO says things are getting on track, but he is also comparing Muskrat Falls to a past project, and it's not a good one. I'll say this. I think this project is a hell of a lot worse a deal than the Upper Churchill. In the Upper Churchill, it didn't cost the consumers this province a cent. Here, in building this project, in the con contractual construct I've described, somebody speculated on energy prices and lost, and the consumers of this province are going to pay for it. So, Rob, pretty strong words. Uh, how is this going to impact people? How are they going to pay for it? Well, one big way is on their power bills. Stan Marshall also released some new figures on that today. In five years' time, electricity rates are expected to pretty much double for customers on the island. The government has said it plans to set aside money to reduce those increases. Nalcor is also doing work on that, but Marshall agrees that it's not good news. It's a hardship to people. What do you think I'm here? I, I knew this is a, a boondoggle. You know, it should have been built. How many times do I have to say that? But it was too late to stop. We couldn't go and get a refund. And we're doing our best now to do what we can to minimize those impact. Now, Rob Nalcor provided these new details this morning. What was the political reaction to all of this? Well, it came fast and it was furious. Uh, the Liberals say there needs to be accountability. They released a report from 2013 that warned about possible problems and cost overruns. And they opened the door to a forensic audit of Muskrat Falls. But that's not going to happen right now. It could come later when the project is done a few years down the road. The Premier says he doesn't want a forensic audit to interfere with ongoing work to get the project done. In my view right now, this, this needs to be looked at. Yeah. So it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And, you know, clearly, for political reasons, it would be very easy for me to do this right now. It would be extremely easy for me to do this right now. Even though it would be very good, a very good political opportunity, it is really not good for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians when it comes to rates. Now, those comments by the Premier sparked a response from the opposition. Their message, bring on the audit and do it now. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. We have nothing to hide on this project. We made decisions based on information that was provided to us. If someone's going to make some suggestion or allegations that, that numbers were misconstrued or changed or, or whatever they were trying to get at in a very roundabout way today, well, then come on with it. Today I just heard another billion reasons to have a forensic audit uh, 
now, not in four or five years' time, when the current premier might or might not be premier, might or might not be in any uh, position to influence it. So the cost of Muskrat Falls has changed, but what hasn't changed is the fight over those costs and who is responsible. Debbie? Thanks. That's our Rob Antle reporting live in the studio this evening. Well, as you can imagine, this is all the talk today. You'll likely have your phone or tablet in your hand, so if you want to have your say, head to CBCNL's Facebook page and get in on the conversation. From Muskrat Falls, rough ride to rough roads. Today, the Auditor General revealed potholes in this province are filled with politics. Terry Patton's report suggests politicians interfering in road repair decision decisions are making highways and byways unsafe. Here and now's Mark Quinn has the details. If you drive a car in this province, you already know the roads are a mess. In fact, you may be one of the unlucky people who lost a tire or a rim right here on Team Guju Highway this spring. But now, the Auditor General is shining a light on exactly why what should be a smooth ride is often more like an off-road obstacle course. This is what a quarter of a billion dollars a year gets. Old roads in many parts of the province are hazardous, and even relatively new roads like Team Guju are falling apart. And here is a shocker. Pavement arguably should last somewhere around 20 years. Maybe less surprising, the Auditor General also says MHAs have too much influence over what road work gets done first. Padden says 46% of the money spent on road improvement last year was decided by MHAs rather than road experts. Half your paving program almost was determined based not on the uh, assessment of officials, but on the assessment of, uh, of MHAs. Is politics trumping safety? Padden's also questioning the way money is spent. One project he looked at was a million dollars over budget, but no explanation was given. Every cost overrun on a, on a contract should be supported by a uh, change order or some, some documentation to ensure that you know, it's legitimate. When CBC News contacted Transportation Minister Al Hawkins in central Newfoundland, he said the Liberals can't be blamed for what happened before they were elected. But he says the government is working hard now to fix the problems identified by the Auditor General. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. This week, Here Now broke the story about a pending sex assault lawsuit against a minor hockey league. The case heading to court goes back 30 years. Times have changed, but what's in place today to protect young athletes in minor sports? Glenn Payette has the story. More than 50 hockey associations in the province come under the auspices of Hockey NL, including the Avalon Minor Hockey Association. This week, CBC learned that association is going to be sued because a man says he was sexually abused by a hockey coach back in 1986. Hockey NL says the checks and balances have come a long way in three decades. In 2004, Hockey NL board of directors uh, took the lead in targeting the safety of all of our young players when we established a comprehensive screening policy uh, for our members, uh, in which every coach and volunteer who's associated with uh, youth hockey in our province would have to go through a screening process. Tolk says criminal record checks are done, and there's even a check to see if someone has been pardoned for a sex offense. And in situations where we need to further investigate, uh, our committee who come from professional backgrounds, either uh, police agents, uh, retired police officers or lawyers, uh, teachers and guidance counselors, uh, they further investigate those, uh, those information on pardons. Hockey NL's policy manual says it won't consider people who have committed certain offenses. These offenses may include, but are not limited to, sexual assault, current prohibitions forbidding contact with children, indictable criminal offenses for child abuse, any offense of a sexual nature involving children, including pornography. Certainly we wouldn't have anybody that had any kind of history. Tolk says Hockey NL's rules are now so strict that a coach can't share a room with a player on a road trip. He says things have changed dramatically with the aim of putting parents' minds at ease. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. If you're going to light up the barbecue, today was the day. And at the gathering place in St. John's, they were all fired up for their annual gathering around the grill and the launch of a new campaign. Take a look.
Today is our annual summer barbecue and uh, sometime before the end of June we hope to find a sunny day. It hasn't always worked out and we have a barbecue and it's a barbecue to celebrate the start of summer. It is uh, for the guests and for the volunteers and just another chance for us to celebrate as a community. We have uh, really tripled our services in the last year and a half. Um, and you know, we have to pay for this and I can tell you there's a lot of nights that I don't sleep when I think what are we going to do. We can't not offer the services. We can't not feed people who come, ensure that they're able to visit the medical clinics, um, uh, have the essential services, services to help them find housing. So many times it's, it, you know, incidents of um, uh, trouble with landlords, it, it's not being able to access shelter beds. We need to be able to be there for that. We need staff for that as much as we rely on our 700 um, plus volunteers and they're critical to what we do. As we grow and continue to grow into very specific areas um, of assistance, we have to have core staff. Uh, we have to keep our building open and operational so you know our costs clearly rise and, and so community assistance is absolutely um, critical for us and we're very grateful the community has been tremendously supportive to us and, and for that we are terribly grateful. What we're asking this summer is when you gather friends, neighborhoods, corporates, put a jar, a cup, something simple on your table and just remember the people who can't be present and and you know remember that for five dollars we can feed you know up five people so we are very grateful for the donation but it truly is about ensuring that everyone has the chance to um, um, uh, gather to have summer barbecues but also to know that there's hot meals available for them Coming up, there was supposed to be a deal. Gemma Hickey says the province broke a promise to the transgender community.
Welcome back, everyone. Before we get to the weather, some uh, great video today of the Ospreys. Shanna and Bo are parents. The first egg hatched last night. Mom returned with a fish, and Dad is feeding the chick. Yes, uh, you can see that there are still two other eggs that have not hatched, but it might not be long now. And uh, just a note, a young osprey usually take their first flight about seven to eight weeks after they hatch. So that's the next thing to watch out for. Mm -hmm. And fun fact, ospreys mate for life. They, par they may part ways during migration, but they meet up again at their nest in the spring. Look oh. at that happy family. Yes, yeah. so it's so great to see that. <laughs> Now, is the weather going to be so great to see coming up this weekend, Terry? It's, uh, you know, tomorrow is a bit rainy, but Sunday is looking really good. Let's get uh, right to it, shall we? So, yes, we are looking at a rainy Saturday for pretty much everyone uh, in the province. Uh, it's going to hit at different times. Uh, it's going to be a nice, warm and dry Sunday afternoon on the island, but Labrador is in for continuing kind of persistent showers. So we do have a rainfall warning in effect. Uh, on the southwest coast here. Amounts about 40 to 60 millimeters uh, starting tonight into tomorrow morning. So that could cause flash floods, uh, that sort of thing. And there's also a weather statement in effect going up along the west coast here. So amounts there are about 20 to 30 millimeters, but could be 50 and higher elevations where there's still some snow. And that's just a warning of uh, some possible runoff in those areas so that could cause you know pooling of water and that sort of thing so watch out for that tomorrow so overnight tonight we have the showers moving into lab west this evening but it won't hit the island until tomorrow morning it'll start on the west and move to the east. So tonight we're looking at a chance of showers pretty much uh, everywhere along the west and in Labrador and uh, some cloudy skies here in the east. 11 in St. John's as the low and temperatures around the, the 10 degree mark tonight on the island. Looking ahead to Saturday, if you're planning on heading out anywhere on Saturday, this is how it's going to go down. You can see these showers just moving right across the island. These are the, the heavy, heavy showers that are going to hit the southwest coast there tomorrow. So you can see that in St. John's, here we are at two o'clock on Saturday afternoon and we're still not really seeing any heavy shower activity. So the morning will be cloudy, but we'll see some heavier showers uh, as the day goes on and into the evening. So yes, we're gonna start the day with about 12 degrees and overcast skies, winds in from the Southwest 20 to 40, get up to about 18, a chance of showers early in the afternoon, but we're really gonna be hit with the rain in the evening time there. So looking at temperatures across the province tomorrow, a little bit cooler along the southern part of the Avalon, just 10 degrees as the high in Fairyland, uh, 17 in Bonavista with some showers there tomorrow, and of course showers as well in central. Uh, temperatures around 17 degrees though in Grand Falls, Windsor, so not too bad there. Looking to the west coast, it could get pretty breezy too along the coast, gusts up to 80 in the Rec House area, but temperatures fairly mild. 19 degrees is the high in Corner Brook. And not too bad uh, up here as well in St. Anthony, looking at 11 degrees with some showers and uh, 12 along the Labrador coast. For the rest of Labrador, lots and lots of showers. It should clear off though in Labrador City in the afternoon and temperatures in the mid-teens. So I'll take a closer look at what's coming on Sunday a little bit later. Thanks, Carolyn. Today, the CEO of Nalcor commented on the death of two workers who were killed earlier this week when a steel tower collapsed. It happened on Monday, just west of Come By Chance. Jared Moffat from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and Tim McLean from Nipigon, Ontario, were working on the new transmission line from Bay to Spear to the Western Avalon. Nalcor CEO Stan Marshall says he still doesn't have any answers about what happened. They find out what caused the collapse. They'll do whatever inspections are necessary. When this happened, you know, we all stood down. Everybody working on towers stood down to make sure, first of all, there's no identifiable issue that affects the other work. I mean, we're, yeah, I think everybody's back to work now except for people working on the similar towers, the contract working on similar towers. That's my understanding. Another first for transgender rights in the province. Newfoundland's Gemma Hickey applied for a non-binary birth certificate in April, the first person in Canada to do so. The application was denied, but the fight's not over yet. Hickey is heading to court. Here and now's Avneet Dillon was at the courthouse this morning and has more on that story. 
Before heading into court, Gemma Hickey knew it would be a historic day. Along with lawyer Brittany Whalen, they filed an application challenging the Vital Statistic Act's change of sex designation provisions. Hickey decided to take further legal action after a disappointing response from Service NL. Uh, I just felt that uh, we as a province can do better, and I expect better, because I love this province. There are only two options on the application forms at Service NL, male or female, without a third option for people like Gemma Hickey, who identify as neither. To uh, have non-binary as a third legal gender, um, I think that that's really important, at least another option for people like me. Hickey is going to court on behalf of everyone who has ever been discriminated against for their gender identity. And you know, here, right here at home, if one child gets beaten or bullied in the schoolyard, then uh, we all need to step up, so, uh, so this is for them. If the court fight goes in Hickey's favor, there are more than just legal implications. What matters is that uh, we move forward as a society and that uh, everyone, including children who have to deal with these issues, feel that they uh, can be the, the person or the individual that they want to be. Hickey is optimistic that positive change will come from this move. I do hope that the government will do the right thing. I feel that there is the political will to do so, and uh, that I think it's uh, the right move. A court date has been set for July. Avneet Dillon, CBC News, St. John's. Sunday is a big day on the Muslim calendar. Eid will be celebrated in Muslim communities across the province, marking the end of Ramadan. In Happy Valley Goose Bay, the Muslim community is small, but without a mosque. Making Ramadan happen is a bit of a challenge. It's a big moment of the day, hey? It is, yes. This is what we all are looking, looking forward, forward to. Forward. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it takes you a lot of uh, patience to go through the day. I think it's just natural that when you know you are about to eat, you get excited. It's a longer day, hey? It's 9.20 at night. Yes, yes, yeah. it's usually longer here. Yeah, so we passed uh, um, according to the sunset. So, yeah, Labrador, it's, it's, the sun sets, you know, after a long time. Most of us are from uh, Southeast Asia. Okay. The two guys that are from Middle East, <laughs> one made pizza and one made soup, so <laughs> we didn't get to try it. <laughs> Once I met few people, I asked them if there's other people in the community as well, and just and it was just it was so much easier because we were all looking for one another. So it wasn't just uh, myself, but we all wanted to find each other. So and that's why it was so much easier for us. Once you're a community, you feel like you belong in that community. When you, when you can find people practicing your faith, speaking your language, eating your food, you feel like you're not alone in that community. To be together, peace. To speak about or to discuss our religion, to be close to God. If you are a believer, you will feel something nice in you. So that is the purpose actually, so that we become God conscious. We know what is our responsibility towards my family, towards my community, towards my society, and towards my country. I'm pretty much used to doing it alone, but I really enjoy having it as a congregation because even the Bible says that. Uh, God is present where one or two people are there together, right? So the fact that we are together makes it more fulfilling. If Northwest Church territories can have a mosque, or if none of it can have a mosque, I think we in Labrador should also have a mosque. If we know that there are people coming here and they'll be staying here, uh, because this community has a lot to offer, we can, we should definitely, and we will definitely look into uh, having a permanent structure. On the other side of the world, young women are kidnapped and terrorized. In St. John's, there's a move to help. That story is coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A northern Nigerian woman living in St. John's originally asked her church for prayers, but it has since changed the lives of nearly 60 boys and girls displaced by Boko Haram. The Nigerian militant Islamic group forced thousands from their homes, meaning many could no longer go to school. Three years ago, Zainab Jared and St. Augustine's United Church started the We Care Foundation to offer scholarships to get students back in the classroom in safer parts of Nigeria. Tomorrow night, the church will host its third annual multicultural concert and dinner fundraiser. Today, I spoke with two people involved in the fundraising effort. Most of the money has been spent on scholarships. Uh, we started uh, in 2015. Uh, or we would say 2015-2016 academic year, we uh, awarded scholarships to 13 girls and uh, from then up to uh, this year, which is 2017, we've awarded uh, scholarships to 57. Uh, 20 of them are, are young men who have been out of school and because they have no money, nowhere to get money to go back to school, they were engaging in crime, so we decided to help them as well. That's just few out of the thousands who need help, but uh, we've been able to help uh, 56 and usually we, we renew, so some those who benefited uh, in 2015, 2016, uh, we paid their their education again for 2016-2017 academic year. Well, I wouldn't say I actually, it's the community, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians from, you'd be surprised, from as far as Labrador City, from St. John's of course, a lot of groups and individuals, and St. Augustine's Anglican Church. This parish has been uh, the, the force behind uh, any scholarship that we've been able to award to those 57 uh, youth in northeastern Nigeria. So it's a community work and I'm very grateful and, and humbled actually and just uh, so, so grateful. I am here just under two months. Uh, I came originally from Belize as an Anglican priest and I took over the directorship just under two months. Um, so I met this organization within the church, uh, and, and this was um, co-founded by Dr. Zinyab and my predecessor, who is Archdeacon David Pilling. And the people in this church, from what I have observed, from, from the language, from the actions that I have observed, they're very enthusiastic to help out. Um, the people of, of this part, of the world, they, I mean, they have a great heart. The people of St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador are the best people that I've ever met in the entire world. And so once you tell them about some charity like this, they, their hearts are open to assist and to help and, and to be a part of. So it's not just words they put into to it, but the action, they put the action into to whatever. In May, the uh, Canadian Federation of uh, University Women, the St. John's branch, donated about 1,000. Uh, we tried to count, but there are so many, but I know based on the boxes, and we tried to estimate, they are, the books are almost about 1,000 books for children, for youth, for adults, both educational books like science, uh, literature, uh, social studies, religious books, a lot of books. And now we got um, an email from uh, Mampara Public Library last week and they are interested in donating uh, books for us to ship to northeastern Nigeria where Literally, you go to a school, there are no books. I was there, I've seen it myself, no books. So uh, from what I was told, the books that the Mampur Public Library are going to donate are many. <laughs> I've not seen it yet, but uh, we will go and, and, and gratefully accept the donations. Sure, it was cold, but it was some time. We'll go back in time to Bonavista and the event that put Newfoundland on the tourism map.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, this time, 20 years ago, the province was getting ready for a party centuries in the making. It was to celebrate John Cabot's discovery of the island 500 years before. And that party put Newfoundland on an international stage. Who knew then celebrities would be staying at a hotel on Fogo Island for $5,000 a night? Here and now's Megan McCabe has a look back and ahead. And they are here after 53 days at sea, sailing from Bristol, England. The replica of John Cabot's caravel is now arriving. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matthew and her brave crew under Master David Allen Williams. June 24th, 1997. 500 years to the day John Cabot sailed the Matthew into Bonavista, discovering this newfound land. Or so the story goes. If you were in Bonavista for the celebrations, you remember just how cold it was. Queen Elizabeth braved it royally. As we look back on all that Cabot lived for, and on what the land he found has given us, let us salute that brave sailor. These Cabot 500 celebrations were huge. Premier Brian Tobin and his government spent millions, with tens of thousands of people packing Bonavista. It was a big day to a lot of people, including Newfoundlander Chris Legro. He sailed across the Atlantic on the Matthew replica, like Cabot and his crew in 1497. Just to think that it's exactly the same as they had it back then. And he was probably doing the same thing 500 years ago. And it hasn't changed at all. The Atlantic still looks the same as it did 500 years ago. Although Legro points out Cabot didn't know where he was going. Two decades later, watching that moment brings back a lot of memories. I had really good hair back then. I miss that. I remember the day very clearly. Um, obviously a lot of emotions. Uh, things kind of like came together at the arrival. Legro remembers the quality of the party too. One people from all over the world remembered. For the tourism industry, this was the moment. After Cabot, everything changed. Joe O'Brien's been running O'Brien's boat tours long before Cabot 500 and long since. Everybody believed that we had to have a special event to create an event, but it's really a place that creates an event and the people that make an event happen. So they realized that it was the place to be and it was the people that made the event because no matter how cold it was, everybody had an upbeat, positive feel about it. There were a couple more big years, Sorry 99 and Vikings 2000, but tourism became more about the culture, the people, and the unreal landscape. That's what these award-winning ads are about, and that's what fills O'Brien's boats every day of the season. And we're a unique destination that they hadn't seen. People travel all over the world, but Newfoundland wasn't talked about as a travel destination. And since Cabot 500, we've adapted to many, many things. Everything has gone on the international stage and put us on the front of the international stage. Just look at this. Here we are riding a boat on the Atlantic Ocean, looking for whales and icebergs. It's an adventure like this that brings tourists to Newfoundland. That was the aim of those Cabot 500 celebrations to take what we take for granted and sell it to the world. 20 years later, the tourism industry is all grown up and still growing. Megan McCabe, CBC News, Bay Bulls. <laughs> we're just laughing about wow. the weather conditions and everything back then. You guys were a whole lot younger. That was me in that yellow I slicker. Was, I was gonna say, if you were gonna say it, I was gonna point it out that that was our very own Debbie Cooper in the yellow slicker interviewing yes. Mr. Legro, yeah. who um. had amazing hair then and still amazing hair now. Yeah. Jealous. And you had some memories from that day because oh. you were you were there. We How did cold our. Was it? Uh, oh, it was absolutely bitterly cold, and here and now the big crew was out, and we did our show from from Bonavista, and uh, it was. I believe I would have to say it was the most memorable remote that I've ever been involved in. It was a huge effort for all our crew, and um, and it was wonderful memories. It's great, great stuff. It's too bad it rained. Too bad it didn't have better weather. But I guess you could say that uh, <laughs> almost any day here in this province. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's going to be a bit of a repeat uh, tomorrow. Uh... The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service, St. John's. 
helping the world hear better. All right, had to get that little part in. So as for Bonavista, it is going to be kind of a rainy day there again uh, tomorrow, but not quite as cold as it was there 20 years ago tomorrow. Here's how things are shaping up overnight tonight and into tomorrow morning. You can see that uh, heavy rainfall hitting the west coast of the island in the morning. Uh, we have a rainfall warning in effect for the southwest coast. 40 to 60 millimeters expected there and a special weather statement for parts of the west coast where uh, there could be some snow melt associated with that heavy rainfall that could cause some significant runoff there. So here's a look at the temperatures for tomorrow. Fairly warm on the island. We're looking at upper teens uh, for the temperature tomorrow, but lots and lots of showers. About 10 to 20 millimeters expected in the east. As I mentioned, more significant on uh, the southwest and uh, gusty too, up to 80 in the rec house area tomorrow. So wet and windy in Labrador. Some showers there as well. Temperatures uh, cooler along the coast, of course, and Lab City there 15 degrees. Could see a bit of clearing in the afternoon. So looking ahead into Sunday, those showers are going to stick around here in the east and on the west and in parts of Labrador Saturday night. But things will start to clear off nicely in the morning. We had those showers here at 8 a.m. tomorrow, but then that goes away and things start to clear off very nicely. So if you're going to do anything outdoors, Sunday is a good day for that because it's quite nice temperatures as well. We're looking at 21 degrees as the high in the east, 25 in central, 21 on the west coast. So overall, a lovely uh, day on the island with that chance of morning showers and some more wet weather as well for Labrador. It'll be scattered showers uh, throughout the day. 16 uh, as the high in Lab West and 22 in Eastern Labrador. So nice temperatures at least. Looking ahead now to uh, the start of the work week, you can see Sunday night into Monday. Things are mostly clear, but then you have some showers that will move in on Monday afternoon here. So chance of showers in the west and in central, but Monday shaping up to be quite nice here in the east, 20 degrees and 21 in eastern Labrador with some sun and cloud and uh, you have a few showers coming in. Temperatures are dropping down a little bit in the east, but not too bad as we begin the work week. And uh, looking at Labrador, some nice warm temperatures to start the week there and uh, some more showers that are going to stick around. Lots and lots of showers for Labrador this week for sure. Time to meet our young athlete of the day. This is six-year-old Liam Calcutt from St. John's. Liam loves soccer and plays with the Mary Queen of Peace school program on the weekends. He's looking forward to playing in the summer program once school is over for the summer. Congratulations, Liam. You are our Young Athlete of the Day. A billion more on a boondoggle. Stan Marshall says somebody should have seen it coming. More from Marshall and the Premier after this.
Welcome back once again. What did they know and when did they know it? Today, NALCOR boss Stan Marshall hinted the cost estimates for Muskrat Falls were out of whack from day one. Were the lowball numbers a mistake or a move to mask the true cost of the mega project? And today, another billion dollars was tacked onto the price tag. It raises alarms and questions about the early days of Muskrat Falls. Here's more from Stan Marshall. There's no question in my mind that the initial costs were tremendously underestimated. I saw that in the capital costs, now I'm seeing it in the operating costs. They're, even at the time this was done, they would have been extremely low. Anybody with knowledge of the business, you know, knew they were low. And so, in order to come here and justify them to you, I said, let's go and do a benchmarking study. Let me make sure now I don't go forward with a number that I'm just taking off the top of my head. I'm getting old, maybe I've forgotten the right number. So we benchmarked, we took a standard, which is a high standard, but we've engaged a <laughs> company that has achieved that standard, and they're going to work with us to achieve it here. Your, have your pre predecessors then, if they knew those numbers <coughs> were low, did your predecessors intentionally or generally mislead the public? And what, I mean, to what degree? I don't know, I can't answer that. I don't know what the motivation was. I don't know what happened and who made decisions. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of evidence whether it's on the capital costs or on the operating costs, which suggests to me that either intentionally or otherwise, the costs were significantly underestimated. So the public was misled? Either intentionally or um, unintentionally. By whom? That I don't know. With regards to the end user, I mean, this is all really about people, right? You, this, one of the slides you've shown here has indicated that people are going to be paying double what they're paying. People uh, on, in Newfoundland are going to be paying double on power in five years' time than what they're paying now, pending any government mitigation members. What does that mean to these people? It's a hardship to people. What do you think I'm here? I, I knew this is a, a boondoggle. You know, it should never been built. How many times do I have to say that? But it was too late to stop. We couldn't go and get a refund. And we're doing our best now to do what we can to minimize those impact. You know, when people say someone should be held accountable for this, if not Nalcor, someone, what's your response? Ultimately, the person who leads is accountable. I'm going to be accountable for everything I do here. My predecessors had to be accountable for what they did. Like I said, I've said previously, I don't oppose any forensic audit. It doesn't help me. I mean, I'm convinced in my own mind what's going on. It doesn't affect, I don't have the time, inclination, or frankly, or quite frankly, the skills to go back and find out what went on. My focus is going forward. How do I achieve the mandate that was assigned to me? To finish this project at the lowest cost, to find ways to mitigate the costs? That's my mandate. Do you think that Danny Williams is the new Joey Smallwood? I refrain from comment. I guess in the thing when you talk about the low prices. I'll say this. I think this project is a hell of a lot worse a deal than the Upper Churchill. In the Upper Churchill, it didn't cost the consumers this province a cent. Here, in building this project, in the contractual construct I've described, somebody speculated on energy prices. I'm lost. And the consumers of this province are going to pay for it. Just after Stan Marshall questioned the numbers about Muskrat Falls, Premier Dwight Ball raised some questions of his own. He released a copy of an internal 2013 NALCOR report. It's a risk assessment that laid out the possible troubles with the project. And Ball says the mess of Muskrat could have been avoided if someone heeded the warnings. Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, I want to take a few minutes and take this opportunity to address the information that was provided earlier today by Nelcor Energy uh, CEO Stan Marshall. First, as opposition leader, and from day one as Premier, I've had nothing but questions on the Muskrat Falls project. These were questions that were left unanswered by a string of former Premiers and a string of former Ministers. Now, since taking office, issues attached to Muskrat Falls have continued to come to light. We have seen loss of schedule. We have seen cost increases over the past few years. 
that reflect on a project that was poorly planned, a project that had no meaningful engagement, that was ill-conceived and reckless. As Mr. Marshall outlined this morning, this province is now responsible for contractor claims totaling almost $400 million. If you add the Estelle changes and the Ballard changes, that would be over $800 million. These costs are a result of claims made by contractors who are impacted by project delays and construction changes. And we know that most of these costs are from inherited issues that were never fully captured till now. Past leaders and administrators may look at these costs and say, well, it's a cost of doing business. These increases clearly lay out the cost of neglect. Well, we've heard of therapy dogs, but what about therapy horses? Here are the two newest members of the North Carolina Police Force. Ah, sorry. Officers Sammy and Gunner are two mini horses that were recently sworn in. Look at that jacket. <laughs> They're beat, helping victims of traumatic cases recover. Aww. <laughs> I want one of those horses in a uniform. That's amazing. Oh, stay with us. We'll be right back. Talk about a step in the right direction. Good news for drinkers in Dawson City, Yukon. The downtown hotel got their toe back. Yeah, that is a human toe, <laughs> mummified, whiskey soaked, and at one Dawson City bar. The crucial ingredient that makes the sour toe cocktail oh so special. Oh my gosh. Now, <laughs> when one of the bar's toes was stolen last week, the call went out. Tow the line and return the missing digit or face a serious fine. The tow taker put it in the mail with a heartfelt apologize and apology. And we should apologize to viewers to making you happen to watch that guy kiss a toe. Oh, that, <laughs> that is looks so that okay. looks like so awesome. All right, let's move along to something much better. Some Rita and Freeman Francis of Isla Mort will celebrate their 55th wedding anniversary next Tuesday. Happy 53rd anniversary to Sid and Phyllis Mercer of Dunville, who celebrated June 20th. 
Belated happy anniversary to Lauren and Emily Keats of Benton, who celebrated their 57th on the 11th, enjoying their trailer there in Terranova. Happy 50th anniversary to George and Maxine Lewis in Labrador City, whose special day is tomorrow. Happy 97th birthday to Elizabeth Lizzie Miles from Gambo, now in Glovertown. Happy 93rd birthday greetings to Jessie McDonald of Morrisville, now in Gander. She celebrated on the 18th. Happy birthday to Alma Stride, who will be 93 next week. She's from Embree and is now in Lewisport. Happy 98th birthday to Bob Grant. Happy 50th anniversary to Marjorie and David Legg of Hearts Content, who will be celebrating coming up on Monday. Happy 61st anniversary to Jean and Bert Hines of, or Haynes of uh, Kellegrews. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Freeman and Isabel Pickett of Heatherington, who uh, will celebrate this Monday. Happy birthday to Catherine Delaney of Burnt Point, who was 91 years old this week. Happy 91st birthday today to Ruby Noble Burden of Springdale, now at Valley Vista Seniors Complex, and she is the mother of longtime CBC employee Keith Noble. Leslie Ted Mercer will be celebrating his 90th birthday tomorrow. He is a Korean Special Forces veteran. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Oroville and Olive Reeves from Grand Falls, Windsor. It's a golden anniversary as well for Bride and George Saunders of Happy Valley Goose Bay on Sunday. Happy 60th anniversary to Clyde and Betty Burt of Gander. Congratulations to Alf and Josie Hancock of Eastport, Bonavista Bay, who celebrated their 53rd wedding anniversary on Father's Day, which was also Josie's birthday. Stuart and Bessie Glover of Glovertown celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary this week. Happy 90th birthday to Mita Watkins from Cottlesville, now in Lewisport. Congratulations to Bob and Jean Young of Cornerbrook, who celebrated their 50th anniversary yesterday. And that's their granddaughter, Katie, by the way. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Jim and Mary Coffey of Angels Cove, whose special day is tomorrow. Also celebrating their golden anniversary tomorrow, Gerald and Jane Walsh of Wabush. Happy 57th wedding anniversary to Alec and Ella Noseworthy from Fortune. Happy 90th birthday to Meryl Stanley of Bonavista. Best wishes to Marjorie Cole Perry of Point of Bay, who is celebrating her 93rd birthday. Congratulations to Ray and Verenia Hodder, who will celebrate their 60th anniversary tomorrow. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Everett and Sadie Pinkson from Wild Cove, who celebrated on the 16th. Happy 95th birthday to Eddie Hamlin of Crowhead Twillingate, who will be 95 coming up on Monday. Happy 50th anniversary to Lloyd and Annette Miller of Trouty. Happy 90th birthday to Elizabeth Fitzgerald, formerly from Belle Island and Seal Cove, now in Paradise. Happy 56th anniversary tomorrow to Thomas and Jean Dix. Best wishes to Bob and Juanita King celebrating their 59th anniversary tomorrow. This couple will be married 71 years this coming Monday. Congratulations to George and Mary Elliott from Mainbrook. Happy 56th wedding anniversary to Charles and Mary George of Dildo. Birthday greetings to Doug Windsor of Fairyland celebrating his 93rd birthday today. Bill Haggerty of Botwood celebrated his 92nd birthday on Wednesday. Happy wedding anniversary to Frank and Enid, Enid Sharp of Kellegrews who are celebrating their 58th anniversary today. Best wishes to Douglas and Olive Dwyer of St. John's on their 58th wedding anniversary this week. Happy 65th anniversary to Bill and Louise Cutler of Wareham this Sunday. Wishing a happy 50th anniversary tomorrow to Joan and Hector Keats of Musgrave Town. And uh, birthday greetings to Merrill or Merle Bailey of Buckins, who's celebrating her 97th birthday today. Congratulations to everyone. Yes, happy Once birthday again. and happy anniversary. <laughs> so uh, before we leave you tonight, I just wanted to uh, show you this lovely picture from Leading Tickles. Isn't this nice? Oh, Another wow. beautiful iceberg. Yes, it's, so many great pictures of it icebergs. It looks, I don't know if it's just uh, the perspective, but it looks so close to shore, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. There we go. Roger Excellent. Arousal. Thank you very much, Roger, for sending that into the here and now email account. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you next week.